you got these two damn stiff corner men in there, and I know as soon as you get that arm going, you're going to beat their ass. Even though I'm almost 60 years old, I don't feel like I'm 60, but, you know, looking back at that film, uh, I'm saying, oh, my God. Well, I always felt that after you went through all that work, the only thing you had to show for it was the film. And you got to keep the film. I mean, that's the backbone. That's what it all goes back to. That's the heritage, the film. The old Bibles, the bones in the ground, they dig them up. I guess you're using 16 millimeter. I tell my friends we probably used to use two millimeters. I'm surprised. I thought a lot of that footage would probably never be seen. In the early 1960s, as NFL Films was just getting started, there was a whole other pro football league also just beginning, the American Football League. But the AFL was something that we just really, we didn't pay much attention to it because we were concentrating on getting our own company underway. So we didn't have time to watch any of their games. NFL Films finally began covering the AFL in 1968 as part of the merger agreement. Up until then, team photographers and local production houses shot all of their games. We later acquired that footage for our library. And as we started going through it, we realized that some of it had never been seen before. So it was perfect for this Lost Treasure series. It gave us another perspective on that other league, its humble beginnings and its eventual success. The most exciting new development on the American sports scene came to life in 1960 with the birth of the American Football League. More than a year of preparation went into the new league before the first game was played. The finished product surprised and delighted the sports-loving public. It gave them a hope. It gave them something to latch on to. The, the San Diegos, the Denvers, the Houstons, the Miamis, they, they were not uh, considered major league cities. My experiences started with the Los Angeles Chargers. We used to tell people that they didn't introduce us on the PA system. We would go through the stands and shake hands with everybody because there were so few people. My wife used to sit up in the stands and the coat vendor used to stand right by her. She didn't have anybody else to sell the stuff to, you know. And I could turn around and wave to her and tell her what time we'd be home for dinner after the ball game and these kind of things because there wasn't anybody there. We were looked uh, down upon as uh, minor leaguers, uh, semi-pros, and basically most of the guys that helped start that league, like myself and other veterans, uh, were people that for whatever reason uh, the teams uh, didn't want them. We had 32 players on a team, and probably 30 of them would have never played professional football had the AFL not been there. We were worried about a job and playing, and if, uh, if there were people in the stands. Television was like secondary to what, to what the players themselves were thinking about. But TV did affect teams like the Boston Patriots, who rarely played their games on Sundays. They scheduled most of them at night, in dimly lit Fenway Park. They used to try to play on Friday nights more than Sunday afternoons. The Giants were the only football uh, team that was being uh, telecast in the New England area. And the uh, competition was the New York Giants at this time because New England was a hotbed of Giant fans. And in fact, that was part of the adversity of the old Boston Patriots to trying to win those fans over to our side. One way to get people interested was to make highlight shows. But it didn't help that some of these movies were shot as wide as coaching films. You could barely tell the teams here, let alone the players. And that's why a lot of these clips were never used. In the beginning, the AFL didn't shoot every game, and from the ones they did film, these long distance scenes were about the best we could find. All the games during the regular season were shot by one camera. The only man that would be in a position to catch everything that might happen in the stadium would be a vantage point from up top. Since our budgets were low and things in those days, uh, we didn't have the luxury of having a ground man at the same game. To cover their expenses, the teams would convince a hometown company to sponsor their highlight film. 
The Bank of Commerce has been telling the score for nearly 30 years. Here, Bank President Carol Weaver, Vice President Bill Gorman, and Raider Wayne Hawkins discuss business. Usually, years, it was bank like a Commerce bank, local sponsors uh, that paid. There was no network affiliation or anything like that. Our revenue came from local people more than anything else. The Dallas Texans 1960 has been presented by the Murray Insurance Agency. You're running around and just trying to play catch as catch can. I know when I was with the Dallas Texans that we had a weekly highlight show. The cameraman went out from one of the local stations to shoot one of the games, and he came back and he had just reels and reels and reels and reels and reels and reels of film. And the, uh, and the news editor said, why are you spending so much money on these reels and reels? Just shoot the touchdowns. <laughs> The cheapest team was the New York Titans, whose owner was the sportscaster Harry Wismer. Good evening, everyone. This is Harry Wismer, inviting you to join me on the 50-yard line of the nation's professional gridiron as we review the action. Harry needed some tickets for a sold-out Giants game, and Tut Shore, the famous restaurant owner, came to his rescue, and he got Harry the tickets. Well, to thank Toots and to repay him for the favor, the Titans were playing the next week. And, you know, you could shoot deer in the grandstand when the a AFL was playing because there was nobody at the games. Well, Wisber, as a thank you to Toots, sent him a block of 3,000 seats in the end zone. Harry was always looking for ways to save money. And in one game, Titans coach Sammy Ball really got upset with Wismer's budget-cutting moves. The official came over and told Sammy that it was getting dark and going to turn the lights on. And so he telephoned upstairs to Mr. Wismer, and Mr. Wismer said, to hell with him, we're doing all right in the dark. And come find out, I think it cost like $8,000 to turn the lights on. <laughs> so we never did turn the lights on. I guess that's why footage from the Titans games always looked so grainy. When we heard stories like this, you can see why we thought the AFL just wasn't going to be around for long. You can really get a sense of the AFL's humble beginnings from these shots of their old stadiums. Actually, playing fields is a more accurate description. In Denver, the Broncos' home was a Pacific Coast League baseball park. It eventually was overhauled and became Mile High Stadium, but here's how it looked when it only seated around 25,000 people. And these small crowds made the Bronco executives very cost conscious. It was very interesting that the general manager of the team at that time, a guy by the name of Griffin, was so cheap that after extra points, and this was before Nets in the National Football League, he personally would go into the stands and fight the fans over the football. Houston's Jefferson Stadium was a high school field that uh, it smelled like a septic tank, and it had this rock-hard playing surface. That didn't bother the crowds, though, who came out when the grandstands were infested with mosquitoes early in the season, and then later in the season it was pelted by these monsoon rainfalls that just washed away all the topsoil. In San Diego, their home field was plagued by a, was a different kind of flooding problem. Now when you think of Balboa Stadium, you think of the water closets overflowing, which they sometimes did, and the water would uh, flow down over the cement seats. Probably one of the most uncomfortable stadiums in America, but it had great sight lines, and it was a place where San Diego really embraced the Chargers. Up the coast in the Bay Area, one of the Raiders' many homes before moving to the Oakland Coliseum was a makeshift park called Frank Ewell Field. I have heard the story, and I have always meant to check it, is that Frank Ewell Field was named after an undertaker in Oakland. And I hope that it is true, because it adds <laughs> to everything else that was going on at that time uh, in, the, in the American Football League. Probably the most notorious of all the AFL parks was Buffalo's War Memorial Stadium, located in one of the town's roughest neighborhoods. We had to hire a policeman to watch our equipment. This was really a nasty environment. Seems like that stadium was probably built in the 13th century. That's the only stadium that I didn't take a shower you know, after a game, and, and I was pretty dirty and muddy. We played there in November, and the, uh, the, the shower spigots had icicles hanging from them after the game, so we had to chisel the ice away uh, to get a shower. The stadium was run down and dirty. 
But the fans liked it, and they liked it because their seats were close to the field and close to the players. I knew some of the fans that were sitting behind our bench because they were there year after year after year. Um, same people. And uh, you got to know them, you know, kind of not only by face, but eventually by name. They loved their bills, but boy, they hated the visiting teams. To discourage rowdy behavior, the team erected this rickety fence around the playing field. It offered some protection, but even so, opponents took other precautions. Well, we always kept all our shoulder pads and everything on, but we had to keep our helmets on because you might get hit in the head by a full can of beer or a full soda pop before you got to, to the locker room. While War Memorial Stadium could be a war zone, in Kansas City, Chiefs fans weren't nearly as hostile. In fact, Municipal Stadium was a favorite of both visiting teams and AFL cameramen. The only position they could get us was in this press box with the writers, and we were on like the 15-yard line. I loved that. I loved the angle down here in the corner. Uh, it gave me a tremendous variety. Now with this vantage point, the footage shot in Kansas City had a different look from any other stadium. But actually, when you think about it, AFL games had a unique look too. Teams were running all sorts of these formations and trick plays you'd hardly ever see in the NFL. The NFL in the mid-60s was more of an earthbound game, knuckles in the dirt defense, where in the AFL, it was an aerial game. In the NFL, the objective was to physically annihilate your opponent. In the AFL, the objective was to advance the ball and to score points. The NFL is pretty much like, a, you know, run three plays and punt a, a pass every now and then. We open it up. No telling what we were going to do. AFL offenses stretch the field, and sometimes the rules as well. Take this play, for instance. The Raiders pulled this off 10 years before their notorious holy roller. Maybe that fumble has always been a planned maneuver in the Oakland playbook. As we looked through a lot of this unseen AFL footage, we discovered shots of some of the league's most unique and distinctive players. In Buffalo, there was Hungarian-born Pete Gogolak, and he was the first ever soccer-style kicker. Houston's bowling ball-shaped Charlie Tolar. He had an unusual off-season job. He put out oil rig fires. Fred Williamson went from defensive back to leading man in Hollywood shoot-em-ups. And Jack Kemp, well, he served in Congress, the cabinet, and he ran for president. But out of all the guys who played in the AFL, probably the strangest was Chiefs middle linebacker Cheryl Hedrick, number 69. I think we were playing Buffalo, and we were waiting on Cheryl to call the uh, defense. And, and the team was coming out and, you know, to the line of scrimmage. We said, Cheryl, what's the defense? What's the defense? He said, just a minute, I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> Another thing we noticed going through all the film cans was how many African-American athletes there were in the AFL. But in the early 60s, many players felt there was a quota system for blacks in the NFL. But the new league didn't have any restrictions like that. The American Football League became known as the Freedom League. It had so many blacks in there, you, you couldn't hardly count them. They just went after players because they had to have good players and, and they were being ignored by the National Football League for the most part. The AFL was also the first league to start a black quarterback on a consistent basis, and that was Denver's Marlon Briscoe. Amazingly, we found more undiscovered footage on him than any other player. And when he got on that football team, he's made things happen. Not so much as a throw, but as a run. And of course, he could get them up on their feet going crazy, and not sure everybody became very excited. As far as being black, white, or pink, or blue, it didn't make any difference. Here was a talent that could electrify the fans, and the team itself that surrounded him enjoyed seeing him do the things that he was doing. I still have the record for the most touchdown passes by a Denver Bronco rookie, even over John Elway. Uh, I, got, I threw 14 touchdown passes, something of that nature. That record still stands, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. So you're going to say, if this guy was so good, why weren't all these shots used? Well, it turns out it wasn't a racial question. 
but a question of height. At five foot nine, Denver's coaches didn't think Marlon was tall enough to be the regular quarterback. The Broncos hoped that he would stay in Denver at another position, but Briscoe wanted to find out if other teams would give him a chance at quarterback, so he asked for his release. Since he wasn't coming back the following year, Denver's public relations guy didn't want to go overboard about Briscoe on the team highlight film. That's why none of these plays have been seen until now. As open-minded as the AFL was about some issues, in another way they were just as traditional as the NFL. League officials frowned on what they called excessive facial hair. Even so, a lot of coaches just looked the other way on that one. I mean, who would have the guts to tell six foot nine inch Ernie Ladd, hey, uh, you gotta lose the goatee? At that time, facial hair was prohibited. They wanted us to be clean cut. In fact, Milt Woodard, who had been the president of the AFL, sent a letter out saying that we don't encourage facial hair, and I'm not sure it was a prohibition or not, but he says we don't want to resemble the worst elements in American society. Sometimes I think the league was more concerned about their grooming guidelines than enforcing the rule book. Look at these plays. All of them would be infractions today but no penalties were called on any of them. There were times when, when offensive backs trying to get out of the backfield, they were almost decapitated. You know, guys would stick their elbows out and, and hit them around the head. I think we had more bodies flying through the air, and I've always thought the officials were, let us be a little more creative, too. I thought they were uh, maybe uh, uh, interested in selling tickets just like the players were, and we were uh, a league that was uh, striving to get noticed, and you had a lot of defense where uh, either you're going to get a sack or they're going to score a touchdown on you, a lot of go-for-broke stuff. One reason why these shots were never used is that weekly shows and highlight films in the 60s didn't devote much time to defense. The AFL was a point-a-minute league. There were just simply too many touchdowns to show. Hey, here's an embarrassing moment. Watch this. San Diego quarterback John Hadel collides with an official. The AFL didn't want fans to see a ref putting one of the league's best passers in the hospital. So this was never shown. By the mid-60s, a number of AFL teams were playing in brand new stadiums, and many of them were better than some of the NFL stadiums. And even though they were signing better athletes, many people still thought the AFL was Bush League. I could have been a teammate in college with a ball player. They looked at the AFL as an inferior. Wouldn't even accept it. I mean, we were second class, period. To improve their image and to increase their popularity, AFL players made themselves more accessible to the public, especially to kids. Another fan-friendly move was becoming the first sports league to put names on the back of everyone's jersey. A true test of an AFL fan was to be able to spell Schottenheimer. Jets linebacker Wahoo McDaniel, number 54, took that idea a step further. Now, Wahoo understood the value of showmanship. He was a professional wrestler during the offseason. I was the only guy in the AFL to have my person I'm on the jersey. But, you know, Joe Foss was the commissioner. He said, man, we need publicity. Well, he says, you can have your name on there. He said, that's good. It's something different. Coaches were part of this image enhancement, too. And they were expected to dress like businessmen. They didn't have any clothing endorsements, of course. And uh, they really were supposed to have this straight-laced appearance. Now, that's Wally Lem. And it's kind of surprising to see him smoking because he was so health conscious. In fact, Wally used to keep his whistle in a jar of alcohol between practices. He said it would kill all the germs. Teams were also encouraged to make themselves available to broadcasters and sports writers whenever possible because the AFL needed all the coverage you could get. There was an ability to have access which you don't have anymore. I really miss that because uh, we got, we got to know the players, they got to know us. It wasn't at arm's length, it was more like of a friendship and a, and a more of a, a visiting, and it, it, it was an entirely different atmosphere. The players in those days were like the new kids on the block. They wanted the exposure, and the only place they could get it was through uh, the TV or the TV shows such as we did. And uh, they were very, very willing to cooperate with us. 
they got their face on TV, and in those days, that was a big deal. We would walk up to the player, and in most cases, they're wearing their helmets, and uh, we would ask them if uh, they mind if we took a shot, and uh, we would ask them to remove their helmets, and they did. And then while we were shooting them, since we weren't shooting sound or anything, we just didn't want a still life head. We would talk to them, you know, we say, uh, you know, how, how you doing today, or last week you messed up your uh, shoulder or something, how do you feel now? All our shows were on syndication. They were usually run uh, in the local towns. Uh, so the fellows did get to see our show and see themselves on television. Here's a play nobody ever saw. Even superstars like Lance Allworth make mistakes. But the league didn't want to show their best players in a negative light. You don't remember a lot of things in football. One of the things that I do remember, getting hit, losing the ball, being on the ground, somebody picking it up, and I was like, I can't believe it. I was just furious. I was like, they had the ball. I got to get it back. <laughs> AFL Commissioner Joe Foss said, put on a happy face which may be why the close-up of this guy never made it to your TV screens. Foss believed a day at the stadium should have sort of a state fair kind of atmosphere. Cameramen loved filming this little jet car. And Kansas City's mascot was a horse named Warpaint, and that was guaranteed to appear almost every week in the highlights. In Miami, team co-owner Danny Thomas brought in another TV star, Flipper. He put him, him well, I don't know whether it's a him or her, but he put Flipper in his own tank with the idea that Flipper would attract kids to Dolphins games. Being an expansion team, you needed a lot of things to perhaps draw people into it. And Flipper was, was uh, very popular at that time, and uh, he would throw the footballs back out. You know, our field goals and extra points when it was going to that end zone. So Flipper was cool. AFL halftime production sported up, I guess you could say a local flavor. San Diego had its very own marching band. They were called Ozzy's Marching Chargers. I could never figure out why their uniforms were red instead of the team's blue and gold. Some half times involved local booster clubs like this one in Boston, and I still don't know what this is all about. Celebrities were rare, although Jim Neighbors TV's Gomer Pyle once sang the anthem in a Raiders game, and uh, that's baseball broadcaster Red Barber interviewing Miss Florida Citrus. One game day attraction was especially popular. Kansas City Chiefs had great cheerleaders. The Raiderettes were great, but uh, you always like to see some different girls, some uh, kind of healthier Midwestern girls. I mean, physically bigger and healthier girls. Speaking of healthy girls, well, let's just say I don't have to explain why this got shelled. Even though the cameraman managed to cover the action from multiple angles. We, we laughed at that and said, damn, I, I wish they covered the game that well. Would I cover the game with that much you know, enthusiasm and that much intensity, that much attention to detail is really what it was. She came running out of the stands and she ran up, and nobody bothered to stop her. She runs out on the field and she goes over to the officials and she wants the game ball. And, they, and she's trying to get the game ball and they're keeping the game ball away from her. But they're not trying to chase her off or holler for anybody else. Then she runs over to Don Floyd of the order, gives him a big hug and a kiss. Still nothing has happened. And everybody is standing around and staring, and nobody can, nobody can believe, the announcers can't believe what's going on. Now she goes back across and goes up into the stands and sits down where she was before. And the game goes on. Unbelievable. By the mid-1960s, the two leagues stopped feuding. They agreed on a common college draft plus a world championship game, which we now know, of course, is the Super Bowl. Another clause in the contract called for NFL films to cover all the AFL games. For the 1968 season, we created a new division, AFL films. Now, even though our cameramen and sound crew shot both leagues from week to week, bright red jackets with AFL lettering were worn by all of our people. And as far as I know, this is the only one that's still in existence. And we wore these not only for security clearance, but also as a form of self-preservation. Because even though the two leagues had legally worked out most of their differences, many AFL people still carried a little bit of a grudge, a little hard feelings toward the NFL. So when our cameramen filmed AFL games, they put away their NFL jackets and wore these. A few of the players rolled out their own version of the welcome wagon for our guys. 
We really got the cold shoulder in the locker room after Super Bowl III. Joe Namath here turns his back on our sound crew and he refused to be interviewed by us. I don't know about that. I know it's a hell of a loss for those folks who picked it the other way. <laughs> but I have to admit that I didn't help ease the tension between the two leagues when I made the official Super Bowl film the following spring. I was still upset that the AFL won. You see, I had been a Colts fan all my life, and in my version of the game, I played a little fast and loose with the facts. All the hopes and dreams of an entire season rested on the shoulders of one man. One old pro. One last moment for the master. I took a meaningless fourth quarter Colt drive and then I cut it as if it were this heroic charge by Johnny Unitas who was giving that upstart Joe Namath a lesson in quarterback. Well, in reality, New York had the game locked up by then, but I just couldn't bring myself to giving the Jets the big finale that their upset really deserved. So even though this apology is a little late in coming, I want to say to the Jets, I blew it. I'm sorry. I was an NFL guy, and I just didn't make an accurate and objective film. So there. And then to go along there, and you listen to all that for years and years, and, and I always felt like they still never did write it like it really was, you might say. Don, you're right. So here are some bites that I never used from our sound camera that show just how confident the Jets were that day. I'm not a daddy, but I won't no more on it going. I'll just run by it. Yeah. Hell, I'm sorry. We should have some points up on the board that time, please. I like to play against this zone every week. Kidding me. Sound cameras really changed everything. And with NFL films now covering the games, the AFL finally had voices to go along with the pictures. Coffee! Get to have coffee here! Coffee! For the first time, you can hear the AFL's fans. Dawson at quarterback, gets the snap. We captured all the rhythms of the game, from squawking portable radios to those healthy Chiefs cheerleaders. It didn't take us long to familiarize ourselves with 10 new teams. It was obvious by now that the AFL was putting a pretty good product on the field, and we were determined to cover it with the same energy and the same artistry as we did with the NFL. We were prepared to give the AFL a full makeover, looking for shots that told stories, shots that were funny, or were artistically composed. When NFL Films started doing the AFL, we were still dealing with the same teams, the same people, and the same wide open type game. But now, we had the advantage of having better equipment, zoom lenses, cooperation, unlimited budgets as to anything we wanted to do. We had great cooperation from everyone. Paul Brown, the definition of old school, couldn't have been nicer. Look, he even smiles at us here. And then he led us into the very first meeting he conducted with the Cincinnati Bengals. Another AFL team that opened its doors to us was the Denver Broncos. Three, nineteen, set, get, get. We were allowed to shoot their practices and their defensive front four with number 87, Rich Tombstone Jackson here. By the way, the greatest player not in the Hall of Fame. Well, they agreed to let us film what you can see is obviously a rehearsed strategy session. You, you still want to go on the theme of Namath or? No, let's talk about this Sunday, just general uh, stuff. Yeah, we had a good week's practice. Uh, big thing this week's gonna get the, get the Joe just like every other week. Gotta players the tried their best, but it still came well, off Rich, looking I, I staged. Looking at those films from last year, you could, I think you could handle that guy. You, you yeah, I think so. I, I've been checking him out in the film, and uh, he has a leg problem, foot problem, and uh, I figure if I can get him going to the outside and hook him and come under, uh, I think that uh, we can present some problem because uh, everything that we do uh, come Sunday uh, will depend on the outcome of the ball game. I'm still not quite sure what Tombstone was talking about here, so he never used any of the stuff. But we had better luck with sideline sound during the games because most of the teams let us wander right into the bench area. You'd never see this happen today. We got so much good material at first that we couldn't use it all. 
You can tell by Kenny Grant's play, he's way outside and deep. Like Hunter said. Yeah. Hey man, hey, my, I got that plugger on I me. Mean, I'm uh, I'm going downfield. I'm just bending it in. And I'm open. I'm sure they'll over shift. All right, well, you are 19. I don't care. No, 119. 119, I think would be good. That's center. Hold on, punt. Just shoot down. Coming off your nose. Oh, my hill. I can't touch it. Here we go. Take it in. Let's go. Come on. Be alert now. Be alert. Another ref gets an earful during a Raiders game. And the guy that's yelling at him is a rookie head coach by the name of John Matt. Hey! Hey, throw the damn flag! That son of a Man, don't get excited, John. Relax. Son of a you don't even watch your time. You sit back there and just throw it. You ever clung one on them? You know, it's funny, but John didn't want us to use any of this. You see, he was very shy during his first year in charge. Of course, that's hard to believe when you think of him now, but that's why none of this was ever used. Game action had a different look as well. Nobody we had could follow the ball in flight as smoothly as Ernie Ernst and Howard Neath, two veteran AFL cameramen, and I hired him right away. And they used a camera. Well, actually, this is it. It's called a Cine Special. And I felt if they could get terrific shots with this clunky thing, that imagine how good they would do with our more sophisticated equipment. Ernie and Howard also shot slow motion. And we found out later that our best audience for this action wasn't the fans, but the players. It doesn't happen so quickly that I can't follow it. I mean, this gave you a chance to really see what was happening. And, uh, you know, honestly, I think all the football players, we never really had, had seen anything like that because we have always just rea we reacted and we did it. So it was something like, oh, that's okay, that's, that's nice. You know, it's okay in slow motion. It makes it look a little different. Here's a slow motion shot of Allworth throwing a downfield block. The Charger highlights never included any of this. They just wanted to show us great catches. But Bambi was really a competitor. How about this lost treasure? O.J. Simpson's first game. The Bills opened the 1969 season against the Super Bowl champion Jets, and the AFL loyalties ran so deep that even in Buffalo, the cheerleaders brought out a banner saluting the visiting team. Of course, those sentiments faded once the hitting started, and O.J. couldn't do a thing against the Jets. He had been the top pick in the college draft, and the Bills PR department didn't want to show him looking bad, so all of this footage went in the dumper. And here are some scenes from what was voted the most famous regular season game ever. Oakland's Heidi Bowl, you remember that was the game where NBC pulled the plug on its telecast with the Jets leading and only two minutes to go so they could cut to this children's movie only to see the Raiders come back to score twice to win the game. Well, here's never been used shots of not one but two Oakland touchdowns that were called back by penalty. Now, the significance of these shots is that if either of these scores had counted, the Raiders would have been ahead late in the game and they wouldn't have been forced to mount a comeback and nobody in the TV audience would have cared about missing the end and this game would have been forgotten. Instead, it became one of the most talked about afternoons in sports history. The only two men who coached their teams during all 10 years of the AFL were Hank Stram with the Chiefs and Sid Gilman with the Chargers, and they were both pioneers and innovators. And you can see that that creativity was evident in the way they worked with us. Lamar Hunt, the founder of the AFL, he's the George Washington of the AFL. Sid Gilman is the Thomas Jefferson. He gave the league a strategic tone and a shape. It was Sid's style of play that all the other coaches emulated. He realized the value of film as a coaching tool. Actually, he grew up around the movies. My background is in the film business. My father owned theaters. We'd have the Fox movie tone. Paramount would bring in these films and invariably, there would be the big game of Army-Navy, 
So what we would do illegally is cut those games out. And when the distributor got the film back, there'd never be a football film in there. The one thing that helped us out was that my dad and Sid became great friends. They were both Ohio State graduates. They loved movies. They had similar tastes in entertainers. They both loved Frank Sinatra and Frankie Lane. And Sid let us follow him everywhere. We just don't believe So there was a, a friendship right away. We shot so much we couldn't use it all. I, I just want to get to those movies. I, I want to show you that manure pile that we played in this last week. <laughs> Uh, let me have your attention. We'd forgotten all about that Booster Club luncheon. And here's more unseen stuff from a team meeting. All right, now listen. Last rehearsal of special teams. Uh, let's make it a speed drill and get this damn thing over with in a hurry. Okay, here we go. All right, down, now, I'm down, sure down, you've down, seen down, clips down, from this down. practice session down, before, down, but the team didn't like to show down, Sid being critical of the players. Down, so this stuff's airing for the first 49. time. What did he run? Uh, take it to the corner, Lane. You start in the middle of the slot and then take it to the corner, deeper. You don't know from shine all about what we're doing here. And, hey, boy, you better start playing good special teams or that's the end. A big gap! Sid also let us wire him in a game against the Jets, but the Chargers got creamed and Sid was so disgusted about it that we never showed any of this. They just leave our backs alone and he will not hit flare action passes. Uh, we got some of the cleverest damn flare action passes it, to, you can conceive. And here's the first damn long pass that we've ever hit on the back. Oh, uh, on Sky, we gotta bump that damn kid. Don't fall on the inside, up the field! Better let the little guy take it again, this bastard, he's too stupid. Go ahead, Speedy. Well, I'll tell you, I don't know whether you there's anything wrong with you, Willie, but you just don't run. Jock, I want you to stay in there, but you tell me when you want a little blown, because this guy isn't worth a It was a much happier day for the Chiefs and Hank Stram when we mic'd him at Super Bowl IV. And this is still the most famous wiring in our library. And Dad was the guy who convinced Hank to go through with it. We went up to Hank's room. Hank was up there in his underpants watching a football game. And we came up there and, and talked to Hank and tried to persuade him to wear a mic. What does a coach do in the big game on the sideline during the course of the game? It's never been done. And we've got to do it. It's got to be done, and you're the guy we want to do it. And then Dad said, in addition, there'll be a $1,000 check. And that was the deal right there. And then we went on with uh, the wiring. Super Bowl IV is one of our most popular films. And here's a few shots that we found in the outs. Willie had it. There was too much leakage on that play. There's too much leakage down there, I'll tell you that, boys. Bobby, you gotta make those blocks for us. Damn it. We can't make we can't make mistakes in this game. Leonard. Two minutes to go. Listen, let's have a uh, they're gonna be group. Yeah, blue right slot. And I didn't know he was taped, by the way, until the next spring when uh, NFL Films put together that 30-minute uh, documentary or whatever you want to call it, the highlights of Super Bowl IV. No one knew that uh, knew that Hank was wired in that particular ball game. Yeah. I think that yeah, that film great. that NFL great. Films put together yes, is really one of the classics. Yes, Something else the Chiefs didn't know was that we'd wired Hank almost two years earlier in sort of a dress rehearsal during a regular season game against the Patriots. What's the matter? What the hell? 56 lead and nobody was on... I saw that. But where in the hell was a safety man? Look how deep we are. Look how deep those defensive backs are. Make sure we keep that Johnny on that anchor, on that tight end, huh? Good. Keep him on there. Keep him on that tight end. We're going to get killed if we don't keep that safety man on that damn tight end. We got three timeouts left. What are you doing in the huddle, Leonard? Huh? My God, what are you doing in that huddle all that, all that time? We're just missing it that much every time, Lenny. Every single time. We're that close. You got to speed it up. Well, geez, tell them to shut their big mouth and call them. He still runs a 56 lead instead of 22 mile G. What the hell is he thinking about? Throw the ball to Pitts. He's so loose over there. Throw the ball to Frank Pitts. Hank symbolized the brash spirit of the AFL. He was cocky, clever, and innovative. That's the one. Was that there, Rich? Hey, was that there? Yes, sir. Fifth 
that's it, boys. 15 lead pass. When you see Hank portrayed in all our films as this sort of a Henny Youngman coaching a football team, that you forget that Hank Stram was one of the great coaches and great innovators in the history of football. Right. And in the All AFL, right, he won more games than any other coach. Good, John. My coach in college, the legendary Bobby Dodd, uh, advised me to go to Buffalo in the AFL. He made a statement that if you want to be a part of history, then go to the AFL because it's going to flourish. The end of the 1960s also saw the end of the AFL. The two rival leagues would combine as one in 1970, but not everyone favored that decision. Lenny Dawson still to this day wishes they hadn't merged because he said you were either an AFL man or an NFL man. And there was great hatred among the fans of the two leagues. It was exciting, but the merger had to come and. Uh, it, uh, it was proven right and uh, it was the best thing in the long haul for pro football. The American Football League was absorbed into the AFC and we work with those teams today. But I wish we could have been there from the start because there were so many colorful players and so many thrilling games that are forgotten. They'll never be recalled because no film record of them exists. You know, I'm sort of glad I saved that old red jacket. It's a unique reminder of a memorable chapter in the history of pro football. We have those memories, you know. Those are some of the things that I, I, I think all of the guys who played have retained. So I still visualize certain highlights and lowlights. We progress from a little sandlot type of league, as it's been quoted, uh, to a team that uh, to teams that were able to compete on all levels. When we started out with the AFL. We were pioneers just like they were. Every father, everybody likes to see their kid grow. Sure, I am. I got as much pride as those old guys do. I mean, it was a... I can understand their emotional feelings about it. It was a... It was something I'm glad I had a part of.